Now, it's been a tumultuous 24 months or so for the livestock sector, probably a bit longer than that. Uh, dry conditions for many, dreadful drought for some, have set terrible obstacles, and many were faced with having to turn off their animals in a situation of where processing capacity was full and prices were falling fast. More recently, strong export demand, a much lower dollar, and useful rainfall have all been coming together to provide some optimism going forward. Today, I'll be discussing the outlooks for the beef, sheep, and, and the pig meat industries in terms of supply and prices. I'll then look at the demand outlook, firstly the domestic market and then the all-important export market. And in fitting with the theme of the session, profitable livestock production, I'll finish with some results of, uh, an, of ABARES research into beef industry profitability and productivity. But to set the scene, I want to look first at uh, the price volatility the livestock industries have been facing over just the past five years. On the left is the, the Queensland price for trade steers. At the peak of the herd rebuilding phase at the end of 2011, prices reached 427 cents a kilogram. Then came the dry conditions and the indicator price fell 36% to 274 cents mid-2013. And it's since piled on nearly another 200 cents again to over 450 just a few weeks ago. Fluctuations have been even more pronounced for the lamb and mutton prices with the, de the demand and supply price setting conditions being compounded by the fortunes or otherwise of the wool industry. Now this makes things very uncertain for decision making which needs a lead time as livestock management does of course. Now I now want to turn to our outlooks for these industries over the next five years. ABES is forecasting uh, the national cattle herd, beef cattle herd, to fall to 23.7 million by 30th of June 2016. Now that's down nearly 3 million from its peak of just two years ago. After this extended liquidation over the past couple of years and under the assumption of approved seasonal conditions, we expect slaughter to ease. Cattle slaughter over the past two years was the highest we've seen since the late 1970s, but because carcass weights are much heavier than they were back then, we've had record beef production. We're expecting this to come back a little as producers stabilise turnoff and then start to rebuild herd numbers. Tighter cattle supply um, combined with strong export demand in our lower dollar will all work to lift prices. We're forecasting a 19% rise in the weighted average sale yard price to average 349 cents a kilogram this year in 2014-15 and a further 16% rise next year to average 405 cents. Now here you can see uh, the effect of the strong export demand. Normally at a time of high slaughter you expect prices to fall but with the increased demand Prices are higher in 2014-15 despite slaughter remaining high. Herd rebuilding and increased international demand will keep cattle prices high in real terms over the projection period. But by 2019-20, we have um, cattle prices easing slightly in real terms as slaughter starts to rise again with the expanded cattle herd. For sheep and lambs, we're expecting a similar pattern with slaughter coming back and prices rising fairly steeply in the short term. I've also highlighted here the current higher prices uh, despite the rising slaughter showing strong demand. Strong export demand and dry seasonal conditions have contributed to the high slaughter rates for both sheep and lambs over the past couple of years and particularly for adult sheep this year. The sale yard price for lambs is forecast to average 7% higher this year, increasing to 510 cents a kilogram. And next year, strong restocker demand and flock rebuilding intentions are forecast to result in prices for lambs climbing a further 15% to average 584 cents a kilogram, and for adult sheep by 17% to average 364 cents. The sheep flock is forecast to come in at just under 71 million head this year and given the strong price signals is projected to rebuild gradually to reach 76 million head by the end of the projection period. 
With the expanded flock and eventually higher slaughter, prices are projected to ease slightly in real terms, but to remain favourable. Now, the other livestock industry I want to cover today is the pig meat industry. And uh, feed grains are an important input to pig meat production. And the pig to feed grain price ratios are indicators of returns uh, from pig production. So when you look at this chart, the simple rule is that above one is positive for producers' margins while below is not. However, pig prices and lower barley and wheat prices saw these ratios averaging 12% higher in the second half of 2014 compared with the first half. While we're expecting... Uh, um, continued competition from imports for the processed pig meat market and therefore some downward pressure on pig prices. Relatively stable feed grain prices should support pig meat production for the fresh market. Pig meat production is uh, projected to rise gradually over the medium term to 410,000 tonnes and that's an increase of about 2% a year. Now in the short term, domestic pig meat demand will be supported by pork retail price rises being smaller than retail price rises for lamb and beef. On the left, you can see the Australian consumer price indexes for the competing meats, and that, that shows the relative rates of growth in prices. You can see lamb prices have risen the most steeply over the past decade, and beef retail prices, which actually started to dip last year, are on the rise again. The rise in pork prices is not as steep. The chart on the right compares them on a cents per kilo basis, so we can see their actual price relativities and, and we can see the forecast rises in beef and lamb prices. What's apparent from this is that pork has been relatively stable and is considerably cheaper than beef and lamb and chicken's considerably cheaper still, which goes to explain why uh, we... Uh, chicken is probably the, it, it's the most consumed meat in Australia. But demand from export markets is a major driver for the beef and sheep meat industries and much less so for pig meat and sheep meat. This year in 2014-15 we're forecasting a record year for Australian beef exports at 1.2 million tonnes and valued at over $8 billion. We're forecasting exports to fall over the next two years because of the tighter supplies and then to increase towards the end of the projection period, but still falling slightly short of this year's record. Also, exporters are expected to concentrate more on the three traditional major markets of the United States, Japan and Korea than they have in recent years. Exports to the United States are forecast to increase 58% this year, a high demand driven by US beef production uh, falling, lower US beef production. In the United States, herd uh, rebuilding has reportedly uh, begun after several years of liquidation and our own herd liquidation has meant increased supplies of manufacturing beef has been able to meet this US demand. But tightening supplies going forward will mean that exports to the United States will be lower over the medium term, um, although they'll be considerably higher than in recent years. Exports to both Japan and Korea, we're forecasting or projecting to rise. The FTAs will help our competitive position in these high value markets, but the full effects, of course, will only really be felt beyond the five-year outlook. Beef exports to China are projected to be lower than they were last year, but we should remain an important supplier of beef to China. Um, competition from relatively low priced beef from South America is expected, however. Uruguay is already an important supplier of beef to China. Chile and Brazil are set to start exporting and Argentina is also increasing their exports to China. But if we just want to remind ourselves of where we've come from with China from almost nowhere uh, until just in the past uh, couple of years. Our exports jumped from 7,000 tonnes in 2011-12 to 160,000 tonnes only two years later. So with our reduced availability and, and greater concentration on our higher value markets, we're projecting those exports to just uh, come back a bit to around 120,000 tonnes for the next few years. And lamb exports are also forecast to break records this year, 240,000 tonnes and valued at $1.6 billion dollars. 
Just like the situation for beef, the increased slaughter of the past couple of years has meant a reduction in the flock, which had been on the rise. Flock rebuilding will see exports start to rise again in 2018-19 and in 2019-20 lamb exports are projected to exceed this year's record. And our export markets, exports to the Middle East, have increased sixfold over the past 10 years and are projected to continue rising over the medium term. But the tightening of supplies means that the rate of growth uh, will slow. China has also become a major destination for Australian lamb over the past 10 years. And with tighter supplies and higher prices as a result, growth in exports to China is also expected to slow over the medium term. The United States remains our largest market by value. While lamb remains niche over there, a recovering economy and the depreciation of the Australian dollar are helping demand in that market. Over the medium term, lamb exports to the United States are projected to increase and we're projecting that they'll average around 50,000 tonnes a year. I now want to um, discuss some of the aspects of some ABES research into profitability and productivity in the beef industry. There's an essay on this in the Australian Commodities publication which was released today. The sector-wide profitability of beef cattle farms has been relatively low for many years and this analysis explores some of the reasons why that might be. One interesting observation is that there appears to be an absence of economies of scale in beef industry. If we use rate of return on total capital as a measure of profitability, we can see that farms in the, in the grains, the dairy and vegetable industries, um, become, they become more profitable as they increase with, in size but that's not necessarily the case for the beef industry with very little difference in profitability between the medium-sized farms and the very large farms. So this limits an important avenue used by other industries for increased productivity and profits. One avenue for the exploitation of size economies is the use and adoption of technologies, for instance, but in the, the beef industry, which is more labour intensive than cropping, for instance, it seems there may be fewer technologies which would allow larger beef properties to use substantially different uh, production systems than smaller farms. Relatively slow structural adjustment may be the reason for the low average productivity growth of, beef in, of the beef industry. And what we mean by this is that resources tend to move more slowly from farms with low productivity to those with higher productivity and this hinders industry-wide productivity growth. An, ex an explanation may be in the large difference in the structure of the beef industry compared with, say, the cropping sector. And you can see here that beef farms in the orange bit, in the smallest size category, farms of receipts of less than $200,000 account for three quarters of farm population and around a quarter of total industry output. And if we contrast this, with the cropping industry, where the smallest size category accounts for only one quarter of farms and only a very small amount of total industry output. Small farms in both industries have lower average productivity and profitability. The relatively high share of small farms in the beef industry reduces the profitability and productivity of the industry as a whole, as a measure when it's averaged over the industry. The low profitability of the smallest beef farms is because they produce relatively small quantities of output given their input use. Two inputs potentially uh, inefficiently used on these farms are labour and land. Labour productivity has increased over time with the most efficient beef producers now managing around 20,000 DSCs per labour unit and small beef farmers can't possibly achieve this level of efficiency. Regarding land, the smallest properties tend to be located in the high rainfall regions or close to population centres, so their land values are relatively high. And so unless their stocking rates and turnoff rates are also very high, the high value of land means that profitability in terms of rate of return on capital will naturally be quite low. Now, is this really an issue? Structural adjustments probably less likely to occur amongst these smaller farms. They tend to rely more on off-farm income and relatively high value of their land allows them to maintain um, some wealth and therefore there is little incentive for them 
to sell their resources uh, to flow from these farms to other size categories, um, which, which would see this land as being high priced. So structural adjustment would more likely occur between the medium and larger size farms. And it'll be important to continue to remove impediments to this occurring. Now finally, as I've already outlined, the economic prospects for farms producing most of the nation's beef appear strong. The improving productivity of these farms will maintain their profitability and competitiveness. So just in summing up now, the, the ride has been a bit wild over the past couple of years, but demand is strong. Our exchange rate is more favourable. We've had some useful market access breakthroughs and hopefully the weather will be kinder. How quickly we respond remains to be seen, though the next couple of years should bring better outcomes for livestock producers. Thank you.